joined this morning by uh, Dr. Marcella Hockman, who is a facial plastic surgeon and president of the Charles County, Charleston County Medical Society in South Carolina. I was down in Charleston about three weeks ago. Uh, and uh, he has written a piece with Daryl James, uh, who is a, a writer at the Institute for Justice at, in Harlington, Virginia. And it was talking about how to improve health care. And he says there's a number of steps that states should be taking. And Dr. Hockman's with us this morning here on WSBA. Dr. Hockman, great to have you on the show. Good morning. Good morning. Thanks for having me, and I hope you enjoyed Charleston. I enjoyed it immensely. I took a, a buggy <laughs> ride and a rickshaw ride, and I ate at Henry's on the corner of uh, down near the market. Yep. So, okay. sure. So, so yep. you probably know all those places, and and I took Absolutely. about eight million pictures of all the architecture because I'm an architecture freak. And if you're in Charleston, I mean, there's architecture wonder, architectural wonders everywhere. And I hope I'm saying your name correctly. Is it Hockman? Am I correct on that? Yes, sir. Very yes. good. I just wanted to make sure I got, you know, there's nothing, the, the biggest ownership in the world is our name. And if we're screwing that up, the, all the rest is <laughs> is uh, downhill. Anyway, great to have you in this morning. But, uh, you know, we, we hear policymakers, i.e. politicians, unfortunately, talking about health uh, all the time and health uh, re- care reform. And I, and I put very little stock in what politicians say, but I like to hear people who are serious policymakers what what are we missing on health care reform? What, what should we be talking right now about? Because everybody says the system's broken, and yet no one seems to have any way other than a political way of fixing it. So talk from a policy standpoint and the things that you've seen and what we need to do right now. Sure. So the um, part of the problem, I think, is that, you know, the when you look at it from the top down, when you're trying to fix everything at once, it's totally unmanageable. I mean, there's so many parts to, quote, right. health care. And, um, and that was one of the problems with the ACA is that it, you know, was a huge thing that affected every single part of health care. And it, you know, everything has unintended consequences and intended consequences. But, you know, you just can't change the whole thing from the very top. So the things that we're interested in are things that could be done at the local level, you know, at the state level. Okay. Which would, you know, literally overnight um, give uh, patients and doctors alternatives. Um, it doesn't mean dismantling the system. It's actually opening, door, opening doors out of the system okay. for those who want to. So that's my interest. You know, it's, it's fascinating to me in America, and I was listening to you talk there, how we go, everything we want to do, we, we want to get it all done at once. So everything we do, we get comprehensive. We're going to have a comprehensive immigration system. We're going to have a comprehensive health care system. And, and the problem was we got there in pieces, and now we want to cure it all with one catch-all law. And, that's again, that's a political way of thinking because out of sight, out of mind, let's get it off the table. Everything's okay now, and I'm good for my next election. And that's not the way people are thinking. In other words, is that the best health care system? No, it's not. And one of the things that you talk about that I have not heard a lot of people talk about, you say the first step is full repeal of certificate of need laws, the CON laws, and and similar measures that are in like 38 states in Washington, D.C. Talk about that a little bit, because a lot of people, that kind of passed them by along the way. Sure. So the the certificate of need or the the CON laws, which are appropriately named, um, sounds esoteric, but it actually affects every single person who's listening, has affected you, me. And that is that um, in order to provide certain services or build certain facilities or expend X number of dollars for health-related things, entities have to get permission from the state to do so. So if you want to build an MRI center, or if you want to build a drug rehab center, or I mean, in South Carolina, we have the ninth most restrictive law. So there are 20 something things that in order to build or provide those services, you have to get permission from the state. Mm -hmm. It's not talking about licensing. It's actually just getting permission to do so. Well, the problem with that is that part of the system is that those who already have a con, a certificate of need for that service, can contest your application and essentially block you from building or providing that service. So okay. the, you know, it's like Lowe's telling Home Depot, we don't want you across the street, and in fact, we can keep you from doing that. And that's exactly what happens. So, so you're talking about non-compete are, kind of laws right here, basically, right? 
Well, that's a separate thing. This is a yeah. this is a a separate regulatory tool, okay. which essentially protects those who already have gotcha. the certificate. So, right. the, and the only ones who who want to keep the certificate of need law are the ones who already have certificates. Gotcha. <laughs> which just kind of tells you something. You know? Wow. So, so it's a system that 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 keeps competition out because. You know, if, if I want to build or, you know, provide some sort of service that requires a CON, I now have to fight against the hospital, which is a much bigger entity. Hmm. And, um, you know, it takes, you know, lots of money, lots of time. And most applications that are contested are dropped because, you know, the people just don't have the the ability to uh, to fight them. However, the hospital systems, they will contest each other's con laws or a con certificate request, and then, you know, five years and millions of dollars later, everybody builds whatever they want. Well, yeah. most people don't have the financial resources to be able to do that. So, so getting rid of the certificate of need is something that would open the door for the access to gotcha. alternatives. Yeah. Um, and all the reasons that the con law was enacted years ago – I mean, all five of the things that it was supposed to do, not a single one has come to fruition. Hmm. But once you pass a law, then you've got special now, interests that are, you know, interested in keeping them. So that's where we are now. Yeah. So we're close. We're, we're close to getting rid of it. So the second fix, and, and I kind of jumped ahead on you a little bit here, is to, to kind of end sure. the non-compete clauses as a condition of employment for health care providers. Talk a little bit about that. We have about a minute left in this segment. Then I want to get another segment with you and talk a little bit more about sure. some other things. Yeah, so non-competes, you know, is essentially an agreement that uh, an employee has with an employer that hmm. they're not going to be able to open up shop within a certain period of time or within a certain geographic area if they leave that place. Of employment. I have one of those in my and business has, if I go somewhere else and I can't compete for does. such a period of time. Uh, nowadays. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, exactly, which is not the, the – it's not – that was not the original intent of right. those laws. But um, but the way that it affects doctors and patients, I mean, the doctor who has become employed, of course, is restricted in doing whatever he or she wants. But more importantly, and this is the part that is, is really becoming an issue, is that patients can't follow their doctors. So if your doctor decides to leave this hospital or this clinic and now they have to move 25 miles away, you know, you as a patient may or may not have the ability to travel that distance or or want to travel that distance because of a million different reasons. So now you're herded into the system and are just assigned somebody else by administrative choice and not by your own choice. So the non-compete clause not only affects the individual who's signed the agreement, and we can talk about you know why that's a bad thing in the first place. Right. But the people who you know who are depending on that doctor are now um, you know forced to either find somebody else or yeah. you know forego a relationship that they've had for years. A gentleman named Gerald James wrote a piece here uh, recently about uh, health care. He, of course, is the president. Uh, Dr. Marcella Cockman is the president of the Charleston County Medical Society in South Carolina. And, and Dr. Hockman, you know, you were talking a little bit about uh, this whole idea of non-compete and, and what the purpose was and that we've misinterpreted the purpose of that in the beginning. I wanted you to hit that a little bit and also how maybe we ought to be approaching health care Kind of like people approach things when you get into an emergency room. So I wanted to hit those two things here in this segment, if we could. Sure. So the non-compete, you know, originally were designed for, you know, high-level executives, you know, mm-hmm. corporations <clears throat> that had intellectual property that needed to be protected. and and um, But now they've been used, you know, for everything. I mean, right. you mentioned you have one and, right. you know, and uh, employed doctors have one. I mean, you know, hairdressers have them. And really the the effect of that is, or the purpose of that is purely to benefit the employer. Mm-hmm. There is absolutely no real reason, except for the original reasons, that to protect the business interests of the employer. So unfortunately, it's being used now as a tool, you know, to at least in in healthcare, to 
herd patients, keep patients within systems, keeping them from following their doctor who may want to do something else with their career. Right. And um, and that's that's a problem. And it's um, it, they're very difficult to to contest. Right. Um, they are contestable, but yep. the problem is that it takes money and time. And most individuals are intimidated by, you know, by having to fight that with their employer. So, um, like I said, you know, they they get used sort of as a blunt instrument, right. to, you know, to keep everybody, you know, in place. So again, instead of everybody else winning with good policy, we have winning by the that, that group and losing by everybody else who's on the receiving end of that, right? Right. So, I mean, I don't have a problem with uh, restrictive covenant. So, you know, if I hire somebody and I said, you know what, I'm going to be spending a fair amount of money and marketing and getting your part of the business going yeah. and, you know, and I'm going to be spending, you know, supplementing or subsidizing your income for X amount of time. If you leave me in the first year, you know, that's going to be, you know, financially a problem yeah. for me. So, you know, if you leave in the first year, you owe me X amount of money. Right. And if you leave me in the second year, you owe me. So now you have a conversation and something that can be negotiated by the two individuals. Mm-hmm. There's nothing wrong with that. The problem is that healthcare systems are using these blanket non-compete clauses where everybody signs the same thing. Right. And they've been tailored very cleverly, and they're obviously you know, legally binding, and they've got all sorts of language right. that makes it very, very difficult so that if it is contested, you know, so, well, gosh, you know, you're a smart guy. You signed <laughs> yeah. sign this, and you got $1,000 for signing it, and, you know, and they, you know, and on and on and on. But the reality is that these blanket non-competes are used purely for the benefit of the employer. Um, and um, and they're hurting the end user the, in the long run. And they're hurting the end user and, and everybody. They really are. Final, There's no reason for them. Final minute here. I wanted to ask you, uh, about, sure. uh, you know, you suggested in one of the things I saw in your article that um, instead of talking about comprehensive health care, you know, people arrive at an emergency room and, and they don't they don't take a, an approach of where we're going to solve everything at once. They're, they're going to the very most important things. Talk a little bit about that last 45 seconds and why that maybe is a better approach sure. to health care. Yeah, well, in general, I think that that's, you know, an approach that I favor, you know, one, the top down, you know, let's fix everything all at once just typically does not work, especially when you have such complicated issues. So the analogy of walking into the emergency room with multiple injuries, you know, they don't blanket the patient with one, you know, shot or one thing that's going to hopefully miraculously cure them. They take every single part and try to fix that. So try to do this that will then help the next thing that will help the next thing. And I think that that, in terms of policy, makes more sense to go from the bottom up, local solutions, state solutions, and uh, things that are determined to that we know will work for that particular issue, and then deal with the next issue, not try to get one thing that fixes everything at once, which tends to honestly make things worse, usually. Dr. Hockman, great having you this morning. Really appreciate the in-depth talk on this, and thank you again. I hope we can do it again soon.